cause to be pained or experience any misery or heartache. Adam and Eve could lay down at night on a, on a, on a little bank beside a river of life covered with lily pads and the temperature was perfect. They could walk over and grab a big old piece of juicy fruit off of one of them trees and just eat it. They could eat anything they want, as much as they want, any time they want, go anywhere they want, do anything they want, and were absolutely, totally satisfied completely. God put Adam and Eve down there in a perfect environment. And the Lord put them down there, and He said, Adam, you here, Eve, you here. And they fell in love at first sight, no doubt about that. And buddy, I mean, they fell in love when they saw each other. They were man and wife, and Adam and Eve ruled over the whole thing. But God said, there's one tree right there in the middle, and He said, you can't eat of that one, lest ye die. And brother, they had it made. They could lay down at night and not have to worry about problems and sins in the world. They didn't have to worry about their children and their kids going to hell. They didn't have to worry about the bills being paid. They didn't have to worry about growing old and, and not being able to function properly. And toothaches, headaches, back aches, foot aches, uh, uh, belly aches, uh, arm aches, toe aches, finger aches, athlete's foot, you know, and, and cancer and diabetes. And they didn't have to worry about none of that stuff. They had it made. Well, you know what happened, don't you? One day Eve went out just shopping around a little bit. And she wasn't wanting to buy nothing. She was just looking around. And she's down there next to that forbidden tree. And all of a sudden, poof! There was a little puff of smoke there. And an evil one appeared. And that little puff of smoke. I don't believe he looked like a serpent when Eve saw him there. I believe he looked like that after God put him down on his belly. He was no doubt an attractive, handsome, appealing salesman. And buddy, he came to her and he said, Eve, have you tried our latest thing off of this tree? And she said, no, 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 no. God said that we should not eat that for in the day. Notice she said, in the day that we eat thou, we will surely die. And the devil said, oh, you're not going to die. Eve, you're not going to do it. Now let me tell you something, young people. The devil will lie you about sin. He'll tell you a lie. You hear me? He'll tell you it won't hurt you. He'll tell you there's nothing wrong with it. He'll tell you go ahead and try it. He'll tell you everybody's doing it. He'll tell you God did it really didn't mean what He said in the Bible. And the devil will tell you a lie to get you to sin against God. And Eve went up there as you know. And uh, Eve began to look at it. And the devil said, Eve, uh, why don't you take a bite? She said, no, sir. God said not to do that. And the devil says, oh, come on, Eve. You're too hung up on this God stuff. You need to be a little bit more, uh, uh, you need to be a little bit less inhibited. This religion has created a guilt complex in you. And if you just read this book I've got here by, uh, by a great theologian that, uh, that will liberate you, 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 you won't never feel like this anymore. You need to get rid of these guilt complexes, Eve, and, and have a, have, practice TM and yoga and once in a while, try some, come on, have a bite. She said, no, Adam, my husband told me that we wasn't supposed to eat this. He says, Ah! I can't stand that. You mean that old mean, dominating, cruel male rules over you? Why, I'd tell him to go jump in a lake if it was me. Why, Eve, he's no better off than you are. Don't you let him boss you around like that. That old male chauvinist, you ought to, they ought to run him out of the country. Eve, fall for these old, old, this old baloney of the male superiority. She said, I didn't say nothing about male superiority. I just said we was different. And the devil said, no, you ain't. You're the same. And he said, well, he sure don't look like I do. And the devil said, well, it's your imagination. You're all the same. There's no difference in you at all. Are you in love? She said, yes, I'm in love. She said, he said, does Adam love you? She said, he sure he thinks I'm the only woman in this world. And the devil said, well, listen, Eve, why don't you just try you a little bite of this friend? You need it, honey. It's good for you. Try one bite. You can quit anytime you want to. You're not going to get hooked. He'll never, God don't even have to know it. And brother, that our mother Eve, the Bible calls her the mother of all living, reached out, took her hand, 
Boy, I'd hate to see that on video, wouldn't you? Can you imagine the demons of hell, them fallen angels around there going, Get it, get it, get it, get it, eat it, eat it, eat it, eat it. Go eat, go eat, go eat, go eat. You can do it, eat. Come on. You can do it, eat. Come on. And buddy, our mother took up that fruit, put it up to her mouth, opened her mouth. She bit down into that. Her husband, his brother Malone said, and I believe he was right when he said it, he willingly, knowingly partook of it because his wife did and he loved her and he was willing to die with her and for her and but her sin got into their veins and right then was the most dreadful day in the history of the world and what has followed has been one long trail of tears and heartache and broken homes and broken dreams and hospital beds and graves and emergency rooms and, and fighting and fussing and people overdosing on drugs and laying out the highways with blood running out of their, their mouth and their nose. Why? What a difference a day of sin made. All sin brought a curse on this world. You can see the results of that one day even in the world tonight. I think about what goes on in this world. I was just thinking... Uh, I was talking to other church members before service about a man who just came in and dropped his kids, gave them away, just for no reason at all. Several years ago, I know of an individual who had a little baby girl. Uh, some people come by to visit her. The man who was visiting her said, I like that little girl. She's cute. Won't you let me have her? She said, there she is. He took her. He's raised that kid ever since she was just a little baby. I'm telling you, brother, there's been little kids. I heard of a... Uh, just the other day. I don't know if I should say this or not. Maybe I should. There is... Cause I, I'm not sure. It's, it's, it's uh, some information. I don't know if that is out much. But from what I've been told, the cases of rape and child molestation in McDowell County is so bad that you never even hear it mentioned. And from what I've been told personally, there has been close to 15 cases of rape in the last month in McDowell County. They don't get in the paper. It's not put on WBRM. And it's kind of kept quiet from the ages of 4 to 60. Right here in our beloved McDowell County, where 40,000 of the world's sorriest people live. <laughs> I'm telling you tonight, brother, that's what... Listen, you hear me tonight? If there has been, and I'm not sure those statistics are correct, but if there has been 15 cases of rape right here in McDowell County in the last 30, what would you say has gone on in Charlotte? Or Atlanta? Brother, we hear the news. We see the paper. We hear about when they uncover a bunch of dead bodies somewhere. We don't scratch the surface of what's really going on. Oh, brother, if, you, if they, they wouldn't do nothing but have news on TV if they told about every crime that's committed. Most of it, and brother, there's a lot of people commit crimes that never do get caught. Do you know that? Never do. There's murders being, there's rapes, and most rape cases are never even reported. They say the rape cases that are reported don't even compare with the amount of rapes there really is because most people are ashamed to come forward and tell what happened to them and don't want to put their life in danger, so just kind of fall back in the seclusion and say, I just better not open my mouth about it. You think about what God Almighty sees when He looks down on this world. All the suffering, the crying, the bleeding, the starving. There's people, kids over in other countries tonight. Their bellies are swelled up way out here. Their eyes, they lose their eyesight before they're ten years old. And all that I had to have was some soap and water. And they could have kept their eyesight. Many of them die before they ever reach twelve. They go, some of them grow up when they're thirteen years all, they take them out in the jungle and teach them every filthy, vile act 
known to mankind, bestiality, all kinds of filthy sin. When they're 13 years old, their girls are becoming pregnant. At 13 and 14, they're bought by, uh, for wives. And not to mention all the filth that's going on right here in America. You know what, brother? That's what a difference a day can make. Oh, if Adam and Eve had not a sin and Kess stayed in paradise, it would have been different. What a difference a day can make. You don't know what a day may bring forth. But let me say secondly tonight, there's a day of suffering. Do you know that? There can be a day of trouble and suffering. You hear me tonight and hear me well. We had a good time shouting to victory this morning about being saved. Buddy, I enjoyed that this morning. I enjoy talking about the assurance of my salvation. I know that I'm saved. But don't ever forget, while you're down here, there's going to be trouble. There's going to be trouble. You young people hear me tonight? You're headed for trouble. Dark days are coming to your home. There's coming a knock on your door. There's coming a phone call. I'm telling you tonight, you can be living in your home one day in comfort and your bills paid and your kids healthy and your bank account up to date and you operating in the black and your family doing good and the next day every bit of that be taken away from you standing down here at the funeral home somewhere looking over the dead face of a loved one or you can be without a job you can be without your help all oh, in one day's time what a difference a day can make we use the story of Job. Job in the Bible was the richest man in the East in his day. He was perfect. A man that feared God and eschewed evil. Job was a man, listen to me, that had everything going for him. Everything was going for this man Job. He had 7,000 sheep. I don't know what a man would want to do with 7,000 sheep, but he had them. 7,000 sheep. Sheep. I imagine he made every one of his kids a fur coat when it got winter time. And I bet Job's wife wore the nicest coat in the country, brother, off of one of them sheep. And buddy, she, she had 7,000 of them. He had 3,000 camels. What would a person want with 3,000 camels? I don't know. They drink, uh, about 10 gallons of water with one little slurp. Can you imagine giving 3,000 camels 10 gallons of water a day? No telling how much grain. Can you imagine how they smelled? I bet he had all kinds of them. He had a Volkswagen, Cadillac, Toyota, Nissan. He had all kinds of, uh, of camel. I mean, buddy, he had his, his garages were full of them. And buddy, he had all he wanted. He had 500 yoke of oxen. He could eat steak any day he wanted to eat it. He had 500 donkeys. And he had seven sons and three daughters. And buddy, is the richest man in the age. Now you think about this. Here's a man. What more can a man want in those days? Sitting up here in his house, seven sons, three daughters, 7,000 camels, 3,000 sheep, all kinds of servants. And old Job just sitting back saying, Hallelujah, glory to God, the Lord has been good to me. But oh, what a difference a day can make. You may be sitting here tonight and you've got all these big plans. Boy, you're going to school tomorrow and you're going to be cool. Or you're going to be do this and that. Or you may say, well, I'm going to work this week and I'm going to do that or the other. You don't know. You don't know what a day may bring forth. That's why it's so important to be right with God and live right. You don't know what kind of shape you'll be in by this time tomorrow night. You know, I was talking to Brother Bruce yesterday when we had that funeral up here. And it was sad. Becky, only 17 years old. We had her body down here in the casket and there sat her family and just bawled. I remember Becky sitting right back over in there riding the bus. And Bruce said so many nice things about her. It was and I didn't realize that she was as sweet a person as she was. I didn't know her that well. Talked to her out roses. One day is about the longest I ever talked to her when she was working out there part time. And I was told out there, the youth choir sang yesterday, the ones we could get in touch with. They've done a great job. I said, brother, if I have a funeral, if the Lord, if I die before the rapture, and I might do it. I said, I want the youth choir to sing at my funeral. And I mean, I want it full like it was up here a while ago. 
and sing to the top of their voice. And I said, don't take me up our funeral home. I don't want to be at the funeral home. I want to be down here. I want you to receive friends right here in the church. Just leave, leave what's left of me down here. I believe God can do more with it that way. I'm not against that, but I'm just saying that's what I'd want. And just everybody sat around here the night we received friends and talked. And I said, get them up there and sing! And let somebody, I said, call Brother Ed and tell him to get up there and preach! You say, Brother Danny, good night. Why are you saying that? Are you good? I'm just saying this. You don't know what a day may bring for you. But you don't know. Nobody's ready, ever ready for that day. What a difference one day can make! Let me show you what happened to Job. Job was sitting there in his rocking chair, had 7,000 she- uh, sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, all them donkeys, seven sons, three daughters, laid in the shade in a hammock. About that time, a fella come running in. His eyes was about that big around, like a wild man. It looked like he'd seen a ghost. He said, Mr. Job, Mr. Job, bad news! Job says, what is it? He said, I was out trying to keep the sheep, me and the servants, and all of a sudden, fire God come down out of heaven and got all of them and killed all the sheep. Job, it was horrible. Those sheep were square. They were just rolling down the hill. Their, their, their wool was on fire and it burned up all the servants and the men were screaming and somehow or another, I alone am escaped to tell you, oh Job, I don't know what was going on. It was awful. All the servants were dying. They were screaming. They were burning. Job said, no, no. And before that man got through speaking, and one more thing, Job, and another man run in. He said, Mr. Job, Mr. Job, bad news. This time Job was more concerned. He said, what? What is it? What is it? He said, Job, Job. He said, we was out there keeping you, you camels and the, and the oxen and the donkeys. And he said, the Sabians come from a far country and took swords and they escaped them all. And, I mean, they captured them all and took them away and killed all the servants. It was awful. They was cutting their heads off. They were sticking them. There was blood all over the place. And I got loose. I'm the only one left. Job said, no. No. A few minutes ago, I was feeling good and nothing bad was going on. He hadn't done no more. Got through talking. And another man come in and dropped the bomb. Now, I want to tell you something, folks. When bad things start happening, they come one right after another. But you can look out. Something else is right behind it almost every time. What's the old saying that fits out? There you go. When it rains, it pours. And here it comes! Buddy, every one of you is going to have your day. I'll have my day. We've had our day. Bad news! Bad news! There's always a certain scare runs through me when the telephone rings in the middle of the night. Are you like that? About 3 o'clock in the morning. Mine does it a lot. Looks like I get used to it, but every time... There's just a fear shoots through me. God, what's happened? God, somebody been killed. You know, I believe God's trying to warn somebody of something right here tonight. You better not be so cocky. You better not be so heady, high minded. You may be getting ready to hit bottom. And you come in and he drops a bomb. He said, Job! Job! Job said, what in the world's wrong? He said, all the sons and daughters was in, your, in the eldest son's house. And, there, and Job said, no, no, no. He had already heard the two little blasts. Now come the bomb. Oh, what a difference a day can make in a man's life. And that man got up. He said, Job, oh, tornado come through. And the wind blew and the house fell. It killed them all. They're dead. 
said. And old Job got down, brother, and he got down and threw himself before God. Hey, there's coming a time where he didn't want to go no ball game. He didn't want to go uh, maybe uh, catch a fish or, or just go goofing around. But he went to God. It put him on his knees. And old Job said, Lord, I was sitting here in comfort yesterday. Everything was going good. And now my kids are dead. My, my, my possessions are gone. Everything's lost. And Job, not a lot long after that, stood in the funeral home with ten caskets lined up across there. Can you imagine? Ten. Can you imagine ten? I've heard of people having two kids get killed. I've never heard of nobody having ten kids stretched out across there. There's his oldest boy. There's his next oldest boy. There's his next oldest boy. There's his, next... There's his three daughters. And Job said, Oh God, oh God, brother, you don't know what a difference a day can make. There's a day of suffering. Then, let me say thirdly tonight, there's a day of salvation. I thank God, buddy, a day of salvation can make a difference too. Hallelujah! Old Saul of Tarsus was a wicked man. And buddy, that old man, you know what Saul done as an occupation on his spare time as a hobby? He hunted Christians and put them in jail. But he was breathing out threatenings and against the Lord. Every time I read that scripture, I just imagine somebody coming through like, you know, slobbering at the mouth and, and like fire coming out of my, I can just see him coming through, breathing out threatenings, coming out of his nose. Smoke coming out of there. And he got this big phone and he said, oh, Christian. He just hated him, man. He hated him. He was a self-righteous Pharisee. He had been trained at the feet of Gamaliel, but he kept that law to the and he thought Christians were going against that and he hailed them everywhere. H-A-L. He hailed them everywhere and had them put in prison. And buddy, he is a wicked man. But oh, what a difference a day can make. Amen. What a difference a day. Here he was on the road to Damascus. And he's going down to the... <laughs> and making smoke come out of his nose like that and boy smoke fire breathing dragon man he was actually on me where's them Christians I'll kill them I'll kill them and about that time buddy there's a big light see and it wasn't the sun I believe the sun was sitting down on the other side and Paul said that thing, but it knocked him blind. He just fell down like that, blind as a bat. That light was brighter than the sun. And he just hit the ground just like that. And boy, all of a sudden, he heard a voice out of there. He wasn't expecting... You know what one of them old liberal theologians in a seminary said? They said Paul was out there on the road to Damascus. And he just overheated and he was over exhausted and had a sunstroke. And somebody said, yeah, you better believe he had a sunstroke all right, man. The Son of God struck him down. And buddy, he hit him his knees, and there's a voice that said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he looked at me and said, well, I don't even know who you are. And he said, I am Jesus. And boy, Paul, uh, Saul said, uh-oh, you're Jesus? He said, that's right, I'm Jesus. And, he, and Saul says, you mean this stuff's true that they're preaching? He said, yes, sir, it sure is. And Paul sa Saul said, what do you want me to do? I'll do anything. And the Lord said, arise and go in down there and it shall be told thee what thou should do. And buddy, he went in there in three days, couldn't see a thing and the scales fell off his eyes when that old fella come in there and I and put his hand on him and said, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And Brother Saul, he was straightway, he was baptized. I mean, they had earnest things there. Somebody in there and got a hold of him, buddy, and knocked the scales off his eyes. And he put him in the water. And buddy, he wants, he preached the faith that he once destroyed. And here he come down. He, you know what he done when he finally got down out of town? He got him a big Bible about like this, King James Version. And he come running in there and he got on the street. Corner his head down the Bible says, ha, you better repent ha, and be born again ha, and prepare to meet God. Ha, Jesus said, Jesus said, and they said, Good night. He's changed his tactic. He's changed his tactic. I know he's got a knife in there and he's going to stick it in us. That's what he's going to do. He's going to bet he wasn't. He was sincere. They saw him over there with an old drunk, showing him Romans 10 and 9. And they said, Look at here. He's real. He's real. He's real. It's real. And buddy, they, somebody said, Said, Lord in mercy, what happened to him? And they heard him going down the road, and he said, oh, oh, Since Jesus passed by, since Jesus passed by, oh, what a what? Difference! What a difference! 
since Jesus passed by. Oh, what a difference a day of salvation can make. It'll make drunkards sober and harlots pure and people go back to their job and quit their cussing and quit their drinking and quit their running around. What a difference a day can make. There's been people come to our church and come to the altar here at our church and that one hour done more difference in their life than ever counseling, meeting, rehabilitation, psychiatrist, office that they'd ever been in. That's the truth. There's a bunch of wild boys got saved one time and them boys really getting on fire. It's been years ago when we was up in the old building and I went to where they worked and this guy was kind of skeptical that they worked with. And he said, I don't know what you're doing with those so-and-so, but say sure are different. And I said, I ain't doing nothing with them. I've tried to do something with people and I can't. Oh, what a difference a day can make. But then number four, there's a day of Spirit-filled living. What a difference a day of being in the Spirit of God can make. Let's use an example of the disciples, the, the, I guess we'll say the disciples, assembled in the upper room before the Holy Ghost came on the day of Pentecost. Now, you know what the Bible said? People think, well, isn't that wonderful? They were all up there being dedicated in a prayer meeting. That ain't really exactly the way it was. You know why they was there? It wasn't as that dedicated prayer meeting. What does the Bible say? Fear of the Jews. They're scared they're going to get in trouble. And buddy, there's a person. Good night. We went out and told everybody he's a Messiah, and now they killed him. And 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 some people say he's come back from the dead. Maybe he has. Maybe it happened. And oh, oh God, what are we gonna do? They're gonna kill us now. They're gonna put us in jail. Woe is us. What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? That's the way we get a lot of time. You ever get the what are we gonna do? <laughs> I ain't never thought of that till just then. That's from the original Greek in Acts chapter two, and they said, "What are we gonna do?" I said, "I said." I've been that way. I've been that way, I guess, more in the last few months than I ever have been. And I said, what am I going to do, God? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? You know what you need when that? You get like that, don't you? They said, oh, God, what's going to happen to us? Oh, God, they're going to kill us. Oh, God. Fiftieth day, suddenly, there was a sound from heaven. Wait a minute. But there's a praying they're scared to look up. And it filled all the house where they were what? What does it say? Kneeling? Sitting. They were just sitting around there like we are. And all of a sudden. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues. Little little forked tongue set on their head made out of fire. And it sat upon each of them. The Holy Ghost fell on them. Son, what a difference a day can make. And buddy, I mean to tell you, they got, they got the goods that day. I mean, buddy, they... They were the only people that got baptized, filled, and everything all the same whack with one, you know, without salvation. And you know, they believed on the Lord while it was here. They were saved, but then the Holy Ghost baptized him right there and began his body. And brother, they don't, that, I got a book over here in my office. Any of you scholars want to read it? It's real interesting. It talks about when the church began. You know, there's always big argument among preachers about when the church started. Some of them's got it starting back here when Jesus breathed on them, said, Receive you the Holy Ghost. Others got it way on back there where he first called out the apostles. They said he formed his church right then. The only problem with that is, one of them was a devil. And uh, there's a bunch of other stuff like that. And they all have arguments. i got a little book over there. You ought to read it sometime. I want it back. It'll blow your mind about when the church started. They're almost what's called Baptist briars. How many of you know what a Baptist briar is? You don't have much around here. There are about 15 of you, I guess. Baptist briar is somebody who believes that the local independent missionary Baptist church is the bride of Christ. Only. And everybody else. You'd be surprised some of the big name preachers that believe that junk. 
And they say that only somebody in a local independent missionary Baptist church, or Southern Baptist, whichever one they are, is in the bride of Christ. Of course, that sure puts John Wesley in a fix. Being a Methodist. But anyway, that's what they try to say. But anyway, whichever way you want to believe, the Holy Ghost came down there that day, which I personally believe He formed the body right then, circumcised, they he indwelled them. That's the first time anybody had been permanently indwelt by the Holy Ghost. That's the first time anybody's soul been cut loose from their body, and they were spiritually circumcised, cut loose from their flesh. And right then, when the church began, if you want my opinion, and brother, that, tr- that thing started there, and I mean to tell you, you talk about a different bunch of people, they come out of that like a bunch of maniacs. I mean, they come out of that. Can you imagine these Jews out there? But before a lot, before that, they'd peep, touch the windows, ah, there's a Jew. And went back over here and sat down. And the Jews sitting over here talking, you know, maybe some of these old boys Romans sitting around drinking beer or something, or wine saying, there are you big chickens, come on out here. What's the matter with you? Where'd you say your go? Where'd you say your go? Where'd you say your go? About that time, the Holy Ghost hit. One of them old boys jumped out on the front porch and said, ah, I'll tell you where he went. He ascended up into heaven. I mean, he got loose to preaching. And buddy, I mean, a bunch of them out there said, Please, your brother! Amen! Well, that's what we need in our day and time. A day of Holy Ghost filled living. If God the Holy Ghost would fall on us like right here, we'd go out of here tonight like a bunch of wild men. I've seen that happen. We get prayer meetings going. We'd go street preaching and get in there and a fire God fall in that old van. And but we'd go... He is ancient. He said, well, you blankety blank. No, I don't, know if, I don't even know the blankety blank guy. What was his name? Peter. He jumped out on the hood of somebody's car. <laughs> waved his King James Bible across. Huh? And said, what did he say all that? I, 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 he preached off the sermon ever was. Look here what he jumped up there and said. Others were mocking, saying, these men are full of new wine. They thought they was drunk. They said, they're in there scared to death. Men to go now, they're all drunk. What a difference <laughs> a day can make. Peter jumped up and he said this. Ye men of Judea! No, he didn't say it like that. Sounding too close to the wrong kind of preaching. (laughs) And all ye, and all ye, ha, that well, ha, at Jerusalem, ha, be this known, ha, unto you. Ha, that's the way he said it. Hearken to my words. These men are not drunken as ye suppose sin is but the third hour of the day, but this is that. Which is spoken of by the prophet Joel. Son, he opened a can of worms then that the, the commentary been trying to figure out ever since. I mean, he is a preaching up a storm. You know when a man's filled with the Holy Ghost, sometimes he jumps around a lot in his preaching. You don't necessarily stay to an outline. Oh, Peter just he said, These men ain't drunk, but this is that which is spoken of by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass the last day, saith God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. That wasn't what he's talking about happening right then. God didn't pour out His Spirit on all flesh in Acts chapter 2. Amen. It's just a little bunch of Jews. Amen. You say, what? The moon will turn to blood. That didn't happen on the day of Pentecost. Amen. The sun shall not give her light, become a sackcloth of hair. What are we talking about? Before that great and notable day of the Lord come. Lord, what a sermon. Great day. He couldn't have preached nothing like that before. Hey, fellas, you know where your preaching comes from? It comes from being filled with the Spirit of God. I was saying, I'm saying, boy, if I can get me some good outlines, I'll, I'll, I'll get me my homiletics just right and I'll put Tom Hayes out of business. <laughs> and they'll say, boy, I'll, I'll get old John Phillips and I'll get him and I'll, I mean, that's all, nothing wrong with homiletical outlines, but, you know, you know, I don't, I don't do that much. You know, you gotta have all your points to start with the same thing and all your sub points to start with the same thing and so many points under your sub points and all. And that's good. There ain't nothing wrong with it. That ain't where your preaching comes from. Preaching comes from the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost comes from praying. What a difference! A day. Some of you get down here tonight and get filled with the Holy Ghost. This day would make a difference. You'd be a different person tomorrow. You, you know what they remind me of? 
when I was thinking about this scene, I said, God, give me an illustration. And I got an illustration. I ain't saying God give it to me. You won't believe it when you hear what it is. You know what the illustration is? Popeye the sailor man. That's what came to my mind. I know I got a weird brain, and I know some strange things pop in one while. I said, now what were they like in there, Lord? And it was Popeye, brother. That's what they you know, Popeye was just kind of wimpy when old Brutus was around him, popping around there. But buddy, when he got his spinach. But he'd hit down a big can of that spinach boy. Bah! Boom! Boom! Oof! You know, Turk, like on Batman, you know, all them, them words had come popping out there, and boy, you have to see them roll. That's where the disciples were. They were in the in the upper room, assembled for fear of the Jews. Little old wimpy Christians in there, shame to witness, shame to get out of track, shame to put a bumper sticker on their car. Say, boy, when the Holy Ghost, did, oh, what a difference! What a difference it makes! And boy, about that time, dun, 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 and they got them a good dose of. Spirit. Finish and eat that stuff, and they come out, boom, and the muscles pop way up here and pop the shirt, and here they out. I feel them Jews pop, oof, took, boom, and I'm in there out there. They got the job done for the glory of God. Sunday school teachers, get you a good dose of Spanish for next Sunday morning. Bus workers, get you a big dose of the Spirit of God before you go out there on Saturday. Preacher, before you go out to witness, get down and say, God, what a difference a day of being filled with the Spirit makes. Let me say one more and I'll be through. There's a day of the Savior's second coming. What a difference a day will make. I'm not talking about the rapture now. It'll be a difference. But I'm talking about the day of the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a difference, man, a day can make. Here we are up in heaven. We've been there seven years. We've been on God's ironing board. He's took all of our works, threw them in the fire, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And the judgment fires have burned. And everything that we've done with the right motive out of a sincere heart is going to come through that fire and God's going to pick it out and say, gold, silver, precious stone. And we're going to ever, we receive a reward, every man according to his own work. You say, God's just going to give us a whole hunk of gold. No, I don't believe it'll be like that. It'll be something splendid. Something magnificent. It'll be something that you'll want, brother. It'll be something that you'll... God ain't... He ain't going to disappoint nobody. I don't know how them rewards and all that going to do to us, but I'll guarantee you one thing. God's got it to... A, just a little bitty type is Him giving out awards down here at, at, after the football games and stuff. And here's the queen, you know. And everybody thinks, oh, isn't that wonderful? That ain't nothing compared to the way God will do us in. And then... We look down on earth. And all they are down on earth is an old, bloody, sickening, diseased, cursed world that the devils took over. People be walking around with them computer marks on their hand, on their forehead. Buying and selling. Buying and selling. People will have big old sores on them. You think AIDS is bad now? Lord, you, what do you think it's going to be during the Great Tribulation? The plague, the sun scorched people with heat. And instead of getting ripe, they just cuss. The Bible says it. The Bible says they just shut their feet and just blaspheme the God of heaven which hath power over these plagues. But that thing's going to get worse just like a drama in a movie. Dun, dun, dun. All kinds of nightmarish things are going to be happening. Monsters roaming the world. One third of the population dies just like that. Over a billion people. Just <laughs> close to two billion. What a stinking nasty mess. There'll be some Jews, around 144,000 of them, and some converts out of every nation under heaven that endure to the end. 
They'll be there. They'll be saying, Where are you at, Messiah? How long are we going to have to wait? How long will it be, Messiah? They missed Him the first time they He come. They said His blood be on us and on our children. And God said, okay. And they're going to take a blood bath like the world's never seen during the tribulation. And that could happen within the next ten years. Easily. 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 They're going to say, how long, Lord? Dost dost Thou wait? But oh, what a difference one day is going to make. I'd like to just take a little while and describe it. You've heard me do it before. All of a sudden, there was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh! Go ye out to what? Meet him. You know why? Because the bride done with him. He done got his wife. You don't go to marry him then. You go to meet him. You go to meet him! He's going to call. All of a sudden, there's going to be a door open in heaven, Revelation 19.11. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man. As the lightning shineth from the one part of the heaven to the other part of the heaven, so shall the Son of Man be, when He shall come to be admired. This ain't a rapture. This is when He come to be admired. And that behold, every eye shall see Him. And they all, they which pierced Him. You know who pierced Him? Roman soldiers. And they said that Rome's going to see him, brother, when he comes back this time. And here he comes. And right behind him, millions of white horses with us on the backs of them. And here we come. With Jack leading the way. The Bionic Baptist. And brother, down on the countryside will come and the Lord will stop up there. And they'll, according to the Old Testament, there's going to be a flame shoot out in front of Him a long way and just burn up everything in its path like a big torch. And they're going to say, whose side are you taking? And He's going to say, I didn't come to take sides. I come to take over. But he's going to squish up them enemies till the blood runs this deep down the valley of Megiddo where the Euphrates River runs now and they're going to dam it up or dry it up or send it another way. And the Lord says, All right, we are now voting in a new government. And the Antichrist is taken. The devil is bound. He's put on a chain gang for a thousand years. Angel takes a big chain, puts the devil down there, Buddy, I mean, we get to sit down there and say, What do you want us to do, Jesus? He said, Wait just a second here, boys. Now we got a thousand years now. We're going to run this thing right. Amen. And I say, Lord, you need me to do anything? He looked over and said, Danny, you want to go back and run McDowell County? And I say, Yeah. <laughs> do I get to be the editor of the paper? He said, Yep. Do I get to be the owner of the WBLM? Yep. Do I get to do anything I want to in the liquor store? Yep. Can our church members help me? Say, yep. We'll come back and take over this joint. (laughs) What a difference. (laughs) One day. Oh, you say you're just dreaming, preacher. Yeah, but I don't don't know how it's going to be. But I know one thing. The Bible says He's going to rule and we're going to rule with Him. They probably won't even be no marrying by then. I mean, I, I figure probably the United States is going to get blown off the map right after the rapture. That's my own, you know, that's just strictly an opinion. I don't even have no scripture for that. I don't like all these books they put out about the United States and prophecy. Uh, they probably ain't going to be one the time the tribulation gets here. And it sure ain't going to be no Los Angeles. My opinion. But I'll tell you what, buddy, we're going to make a difference. And we're going to rule this thing for a thousand years. And out in the middle of the desert, big pretty rose bushes is going to pop up, and little kids going to pick up rattlesnakes and spiders. Man, I told them in our business meeting last night about yesterday what happened. 
It was a, it was a rough day yesterday. I had a funeral, wedding, business meeting, trying to study. Keep. I fixed eggs yesterday morning, and hey, y'all be. Pre- I fixed eggs and French toast and bacon this morning. And uh, I, I fixed eggs and got everything going. The kids were screaming, and Chris hollered out, "Daddy, my turtle's gone." I said, what turtle? I didn't know she had a turtle. she got a turtle the night before. She'll pick up any animal she can find. Don't care what it is, she'll pick it up. She had a turtle in a box, and the thing had got out of the box, and it was somewhere in the house. I said, it ain't loose in the house. And she said, I said, where's it at? And she said, I don't know. I said, you get in there and find it. I said, okay, help her find that crazy turtle. Get it out of here. It'll stink her house up. And she said, I'll get some of that stuff and spray on it that make it don't stain. I said, go on and find it. They finally found it yesterday evening under my guitar. Hunted, hunted for it half a day. I figured it was, in the, it was on the bed. I figured it was up under the pillar somewhere. And I looked for a little and I had to come on up here. But, and I thought about it. Man, one of these days, little kids will be able to just take spiders and snakes and anything. Pet them, play with them. You know why? Because the Lord's going to come back and change everything. What a difference a day can make. What a day that will be. Can we sing that, Brother John? Come on up here. Let's sing tonight. There is coming a day. That's what I've been preaching on.